who paid my debt. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, church, for singing out such beautiful song and, and word and praise unto the Lord. Thank you, uh, singers and team, praise team. Gosh, that's a great old song right there. And a reminder, that's uh, uh, what we're going to get into a little bit in the Bible today in Galatians chapter number 5. We're going to finish out Galatians 5 today, pick it up around verse number 19, and finish it out. And it really is a reminder uh, as we've been going through Galatians 5 to say, okay, God, I, I have this liberty in Christ. Stand fast in that liberty and, and really live in that place and understand what you did for me. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and now white as snow. And in that thinking, you today, believer, you're truly born again, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you know. I mean, if you're saved, you know you're saved. You know. The Holy Spirit of God, the presence of God is within, and, and Paul's been teaching the church, the Holy Spirit's teaching us as the church over the last few weeks of what it really means to have a life that's led by the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and, and really have a, a life that is built upon, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And you were just singing words in that vein, in that uh, real strong doctrinal thought that everything that Jesus Christ did, the work of the cross, it finished and all the work is done. And, and so here we are in our final message of chapter number five, one of the, one of the best chapters, I think, in the the Word of God for its doctrine and for its reproof and correction, instruction and righteousness. We know all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable in that way. And uh, Paul is now in a place of chapter 5 and 6 of some really practical applications of this liberty in Christ. My salvation for by grace, my walk with the Lord, my, my desire to serve should be met with not a works of the flesh basis, but rather with the fruit of the Spirit basis, with a, a place where I'm learning from the Word of God, that I'm being led by the Holy Spirit of God. And, and again, that's a big part of what Galatians is showing us. You can look at a place of saying, okay, I have this liberty in Christ. And uh, I can look at that and say, okay, yeah, that's good, but I'm going to favor legalism. Or, yeah, that looks good, but I'm going to favor license. And uh, if we look at, as I do uh, the last two, three, four weeks, is just to give you some highlights, some, uh, some ESPN highlights, uh, some uh, Sports Center highlights, we're reminded that uh, when we first started this chapter, we looked at verse number one down through, I believe, verse five or six, and we, we really concentrated on the message and the reality of, hey, this is a command. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. You're free. Jesus paid it all. You don't have to answer to that sin. You don't have to live in that flesh and that sin in the works of the flesh. You can live truly and completely by the leading of the Holy Spirit of God as he confirms and teaches you the word of God. Because the second half of the verse says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, which means very simply that you that were lost were in bondage now you're saved, born again, stand fast in the liberty where, where you are. But if you go back and now attempt to live this life that you now have, pleasing the flesh, you've got something different going on inside here now before you were lost. You, you didn't have any conflict. Life was maybe a battle of your own choosing and failure and heartache and sin and flesh. And you didn't have that battle of the, or the spiritual warfare where the Holy Spirit's uh, warring against you. And the Bible teaches that we don't war after the flesh. It's a spiritual warfare. That's why we cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against God. He says that our weapons are not carnal, they're spiritual. And he says, again in that verse, don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, which is going after pleasing the flesh and going after pleasing God in your flesh Legalistically, we then looked at this idea of being hindered or troubled or being bewitched earlier. And 
uh, Galatians, we see that Paul asked this question, um, who has bewitched you? Have you ever been bewitched? Have you ever been fooled? And, and uh, as it says in the meaning of it in the concordance, to bring evil on one by feigning praise or an evil eye, to charm someone, to speak ill of one. Have you ever been bewitched? Well, also, too, have you been hindered? Hey, you did run well for a while. You were walking the Lord. You were walking and being led by the Holy Spirit. You were, you were favoring the word and, and what it says about being sanctified and, and being saved by grace, and now you're being hindered. You're being be- beat back. Like we talked about the definition, it would be like you're on a ship on the ocean, and a storm comes up, and it pushes the ship back. It beats you back. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who troubled you, Paul said later in, chap- in the chapter, who troubles you and hinders you and bewitches you? So we looked at how things can be hindering in our walk with the Lord and our walk in and being led by the Holy Spirit. Then, of course, we were last time we were in Galatians. I know last week we had our message in Father's Day and and of hurting parents and looking at that. And now, and two weeks ago, we were in this passage, and now we're being reminded, hey, remember when we looked at verse number 13 down through verse number 18 two Sundays ago? And he said in verse number 13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. He's speaking. Hey, brethren, I want to remind you who I'm talking to. Hey, Christian. Hey, believer. My brother in the Lord... Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. He goes through and, and really just brings out some important principles. And then he says in verse number 16, walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's kind of like, and again, a simple illustration. It breaks down a little bit because you, you can't get any better than God's word straight up. But you think, okay. It's like saying, today, you know what, I'm going to start a diet, and I'm going to walk in this keto thing. I'm going to walk in keto, I'm going to do keto, I'm going to continue to stay with it, I'm not going to put any sugars and carbs and all that stuff in my body, and I'm not, I'm not going to defer and deter from the mission. Well then, of course, you have to say, okay, I'm not going to fulfill my lust for Cheetos. Now, Cheetos are pretty good, don't you think? Maybe pretzels. How about the big three? Potato chips, pretzels, popcorn. Obviously, I'm dating myself. That's the 50s and the 60s snacks is what we had. You know, that's all we got. And then we say, okay, wait a minute. I can have a cheat day. That's my friend Dave, my dear friend Dave, cheat day. Dave works really, really hard. So he can have cheat day. Now think of this, because spiritually speaking, we don't want to do this ever. That I would end up saying, okay, I've walked with the Lord for a couple of years. Now I'm going to have a cheat year. Think of what we're thinking here. I've been reading the Word of God. I'm getting closer to the Word of God. I'm listening to Bible teaching. I'm growing in the grace and knowledge. You know what? I've been doing so well, I'm going to have a couple of cheat weeks. You give this flesh a license, look out, believer. That's what Paul's going to teach us today. That's what we're going to learn from the Word of God. What can happen when this flesh runs away? Because you'll look just like a lost person. Lost people, you don't know any difference. I I know, before I got saved, raising hell was no problem. Not realizing that I was going to go to hell and thought it was a joke. I thought it was funny. I'll party with my buddies in hell. It'll be fine. No problem. Until I realize what the word of God said. You see, Paul wants the church to hear. The Holy Spirit wants the church to hear. That we need to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Our title today. Spoiler alert. We know that's giving you a little preview as to what's to come. And it's, well... This isn't really a spoiler alert. You know this. Life is a battle. Now, for a lot of people, it's a battle being sucked into this world's battle. And so you think, well, the battle is me having enough money, me having my house taken care of, me and my physical health and all that. And you think that's your battle. Sorry, that's not the battle. Believer, this is the battle that Paul's saying right here. 
Paul's saying that there is a battle, and there is a battle going on between the Holy Spirit of God within you and your flesh that you need to walk around with. And when we realize, hey, I'm crucified. My sin does not need to be fed. I don't need to go down that road. Who hindered you? Who troubled you? Who bewitched you? That you can go back there and say, okay, flesh, have a good time. Because guess what? We all have done it. For some of us that have realized that that's not a good path to go down, we realize the true battle every day, though, is whether or not I'm going to choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ or I'm going to follow my fleshly desires as a born-again believer. Because as a lost man, I woke up in the morning and I only had one thing to do, and that's to take care of me. I didn't care about no one else. I didn't care about God. I had religiousness. I was a wonderful religious person as far as I was concerned. And I didn't have a battle in life like that. I didn't have a spiritual battle. In fact, this world has made you believe that the, the battle is really for your physical health. Everybody, it's not. It's not. It's a spiritual battle. You and I are in a warfare. And if you get convinced that your physical life is more important than the soul of another man or woman, the devil's got you. And to thinking that we have foolishly believed in the physical battle to be more important than the spiritual battle that we're in the midst of. We are in an unreal spiritual battle, and it's happened century after century after century. And if you read the Bible, it's been going on since they started writing the first letter, the Acts of the Apostles, the Gospels of Jesus Christ. You can see the battle. One battle is, hey, we got a fleshly carnal battle. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 tells me we don't have a war after our flesh. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons that we have in order to win that battle, believers, are not carnal. We cast down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against God. We have a spiritual battle, everybody. And we need to get into it big time. Or else we acquiesce, we backpedal, we give in. The physical stuff is real. I'm not saying it's not. But how did it become that life is a battle has been relegated and minimized into thinking that I can give place to my flesh and let my flesh do whatever what it wants to do. And the Holy Spirit saying, I have enabled you to fulfill the law of love. I, the Holy Spirit, have given you the power to overcome the flesh. I, the Holy Spirit, will give you the ability to produce fruit. And that spiritual battle and that spiritual warfare the flesh, it sneaks up upon us. It's, it's like a, a secret agent. It comes around and it fools us into believing that I can sit on my backside all day long and let just things go by and my life will be just fine and I can handle this and I can handle that. Boy, I need to wake up and realize I can't handle nothing without the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't handle anything without the Word of God. I cannot have a Spirit-filled life without giving the permission to the Holy Spirit to grow that fruit in me and have Him be an indwelling Holy Spirit that's deeply filling me instead of me saying, I'm going to quench you today. I'm going to grieve you today. I'm going to just like not bother with you today. Our flesh desires to make things, makes works, makes stuff. You know what? We think we really can do this law-abiding stuff and Paul says, well, then go back and try and fulfill the whole thing. You can't. You and I are supposed to walk in the spirit that we would not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusteth against the spirit. The spirit against the flesh. We'll get into that. Let's read our passage of scripture this morning and realize that, yes, there's many battles in life. But the big battle, believer, 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 the big battle here is the spiritual warfare that we're in. The spiritual wickedness in high places can fool us into believing that the only battle we have is whether or not we can pay our bills, whether or not they're going to be able to get through another week, whether or not in our battle that we can overcome the help. Gosh, people, I know that some of you have suffered for years over physical difficulties, and you have shown me a testimony of the Lord. Let's look at what Paul's telling us about what the works of the flesh can do versus what the fruit of the Spirit can do. That's our whole message today. We do have a battle, and life is a battle, but guess what? 
We have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you know that, but let's see in the Holy Spirit of God's work in our lives through the Word of God what he can do for us. Verse 19, quick reminder. By the way, I really think that it's like a good news, bad news thing, and God says, okay, you want the good news or the bad news first? And I guess we didn't have a choice because here's the bad news. (laughs) Verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Verse number 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Understand, these are a list of sins. It's not calling someone out as a sinner. We'll look at 1 Corinthians 6 in a comparative passage here in a minute. But understand this. It's saying here in these lists of sins that the works of the flesh are manifest, which is made evident. The works of the flesh can do any of these things. We'll look at the meaning of some of them here in a moment. He says in the continuum of verse number 21, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Really powerful statement there. We'll get into that here in a little bit. Verse 22, here's the good news. I like the good news. This is the good news. But the fruit of the Spirit, believer, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. They're all listed as fruits, but they're fruit. Singularly spoken in the Spirit of God, they're fruit that come into you. Against such there is no law. No one will arrest you for being gentle. There is no jail sentence. You won't get pulled over and be arrested for joy. Have you ever gotten pulled over for joy? There's no law against this. Well, I thought that was more complicated. Well, (laughs) God's word very simply is saying there's no laws against living this life. There's no law against love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. It's no law. You can have at it all day long. I don't know what I can do to please the Lord. (laughs) Walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Verse number 24 down through 26. Now he kind of really just maybe reaches across the table and goes again like, cush. Now look at this now. And they that are Christ's believers in the Lord have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Hey, I put that thing to bed. It's dead. That flesh is dead. If we live in the Spirit, verse 25, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory. Verse 26, provoking one another, challenging other people, and envying one another, going around saying, I see your life, and I see your life, and we start doing this vainglory. Look, I'm better than you as a Christian. That's not what this is about. This is the crucified life of Jesus Christ. Remember, you can't live the crucified life. You attach yourself to the one who lived the crucified life and crucified. You can't put yourself on a cross someone would have to crucify you. He says, hey, the flesh is dead. It's made dead by Jesus Christ when you're born again. And the Spirit is alive. If the Holy Spirit of God has not taken residence in you, then that's a really huge spoiler alert that you are lost. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Bible says clearly, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I don't want to be boasting of anything that I've ever done. I don't want to be in a place where I think that I could earn my way into heaven, but that's the way I was taught in my religiousness before someone showed me the Bible. Somebody showed me for the very first time what it meant. The first time I saw that verse, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I went, are you kidding me? Is that in the Bible? Really? You mean to tell me I can't earn my way to heaven? I, I shouldn't earn my way to heaven? I, 
I, what? You know what I'm talking about, Steve. I earned my way to heaven. Come on, what do you tell me? First person ever showed that to me. A man named Chris Bando in Winter Ball. He cared so much about my soul. He's a man that grew up in religiousness, that converted to Christ. He knew Jesus Christ as Savior. I'd never seen or understood Bible verses like that. I'd gone a couple Bible studies just to think I was some Bible expert. And I realized that he's telling me something that I have never, ever heard before. I thought you had to earn your way to heaven. You see, we need to settle in here, church, and understand something. The battle for the believer is real. The battle for the lost person is a different battle, but it's not like yours. Because this is a spiritual battle we have. And if we get sucked in, soldiers, if we get sucked in, saints, if we really believe that our battle is of the flesh, then we're going against the word of God. God's teaching us about what the flesh will do and what the spirit will do if we would just give permission to the Holy Spirit to do what he desires to do. It says up on the screen, verse number 17, that was from last time, very simply this. When I think about what the flesh does and how the flesh wars and battles in me, this verse is so clear. Romans chapter number 8, the first 13 verses, they're right on the money about the same thing. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. We even called this out and talked about it a couple weeks ago in this message. Do you know the spirit lusteth against the flesh? It wants that reign over, and it lusts against the flesh to have you as the one that it leads. The Spirit wants to lead you. The Holy Spirit that's in you, believer, wants to lead you. And they're contrary one to them. They can't do the things that they would. It, it's just, it's a, it's a wrestling match. It's a battle. So, spoiler alert, the flesh lusts against the Spirit. Yes, I got that. Well, we have a wrestling match within. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number 6, the only time that the word wrestle shows up in your Bible, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You really think that there's any more difficult battle than that one right there? We have wrestling within. It's whether or not the flesh is going to win over the spirit because they lust to have the preeminence in our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. Spoiler alert number two when it comes to the spirit and the flesh. The flesh is contrary to the Holy Spirit. There's a contrariness. It means to oppose. When you're contrary, you oppose. You're an adversary to be set over against, to be the opposite of, to oppose, to be adverse to. That's what's going on here. We have opposing sides. And it's real. And after I got saved and after you got saved, you realized this flesh wants to have a place in you, and you have to say, I want the Holy Spirit of God to have his way. That's the word of God working in you, and God's will needs to be working in you. It's so important, so powerful. Look at the next three verses up there. Matthew 26, verse number 41. Remember when Jesus asked the disciples, could you just watch and pray? Remember? They enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. What? The flesh is weak. The flesh does not have the power to do things for God. Well, that's major revelation, Pastor. Hey, listen. How is it that we continue to think that this flesh can do things to please God? It cannot. If you are attempting to please God in your flesh, you are weak and foolish and it's not going to happen. God will not be pleased with that. It says in Mark's account in chapter number 14, watch ye pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, 
It's ready. But the flesh is weak. They are not regenerated yet. Has the Holy Ghost shown up in those disciples' lives? No. They have a covering of the Spirit of the Lord that's with them. His name is Jesus. But he's about to leave and he says, I will send you another comforter. And when he comes, he will teach you all things. But they don't have him in their own power. They were separated from Jesus Christ in his presence while he's in agony in the garden. And they thought they could rely on their own flesh, like you and me. We're the same. It says in Romans chapter number 8, just another reminder of that incredible chapter. And we have referenced Roman eights and a lot of Romans in our study because they are companion books. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of, his, of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. Do you think you can condemn sin in your flesh? No. That's why you call on the name of the Lord to save you and he will condemn it. And then he gives you the power of the Holy Spirit of God within you. He gives you the power of the word of God to work in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And now you have power in the spirit of God over this sinful flesh. But if you're unconverted, you're not born again, you're not saved, you do not have that. And if you're saved but you are not walking in the Spirit, you're not living in the Spirit, you're not being led by the Spirit of God, you're not spending time in the Word of God, you're not letting the Word of God dwell in you richly, then guess what? You're as carnal and as messy as any person that is lost except for, guess what, your eternity settled with the Lord. You would be just like the prodigal son that said, I want my inheritance. And he got it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that that prodigal son that came back ever got his inheritance. But that's not what he wanted. He never lost his sonship from his father. That's a powerful, powerful truth. And that's what this rests on because you are a son of God, believer. Behold what manner of love the fathers bestowed upon you that we would be called the sons of God as many as received in them, give you power to become the sons of God. We are in him sons of God. And he says, hey, I condemn that flesh. It is dead. You have a new life in Christ. And it has all to do with you and me going, wait a minute, which way will I go? Which way will I serve? How will I walk in this life? How will I, will I be led by the flesh? As a born again believer, a son of God, will I be led by the Holy Spirit of God? So then I pop up there. Galatians 5.18, just to be reminded of what the Holy Spirit will do. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. It's right there. So verse number 16, 17, and 18, we borrowed from last time we were together because it's all in Scripture contests. Again, being reminded. Verse number 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. I'm talking to you believers. And if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Verse number 18. Hey, guess what? Spoiler alert, the Holy Spirit's leading frees us to live faith. He says, hey, you can live faith. People, they look at that and a little thing up there, live faith, Galatians 2.20, that sounds good. And a lot of people might say, well, I'm having a, I'm trying to do that. Somebody was telling me this past week, I said, that's great that you're saying, I'm trying to do that. That's like saying, you know, I'm trying to lose weight. Obviously, you can say, I'm not trying hard enough. But what about this? What if I say I'm going to submit myself to a nutritionist? I'm going to sit my, submit myself to someone who's going to be a, a, a workout person, and they're going to show me how to do that. Now I've taken bigger steps. Now I've gotten more serious. You see, the Holy Spirit leads and his leading frees us to live faith. If I say, okay, teach me God. I'm not just going to uh, listen to the people that teach on Sundays. They're good. They're okay. I got a good Bible lesson from Doc Clemmer. Praise the Lord today. Got a good Bible lesson from Brian Calloway. Dwayne Allen's teaching in there right now. The kids got good teaching. There's teaching everywhere. There's Tuesday nights, Monday nights. There's, teach there's Bible teaching everywhere. And if you say, that's all I want to learn, that's fine to a point. But the Holy Spirit's saying... I want to free you to live faith. I want to be the one that teaches you. Would you give me permission? 
Would you sit down and put the Bible on your lap and read through the book of Romans this week? Would you sit down and put the Bible on your lap and read through the book of Joshua? Would you sit down and read the Bible through and have, let me teach you, Holy Spirit wants to teach you. He, he says, you can live in the liberty that I've given you. You have everything at your disposal. Spoiler alert, the Holy Spirit's indwelling fills us with fruit. Do we manifest fruit? Do we live in liberty? Do we manifest fruit? See, we're not supposed to f put our will against the flesh, but we're supposed to take our will and say, I'm not trying anymore. In fact, Holy Spirit, you do the work in me. I'm going to go into the Word of God and have the Word of God work. And as Jesus said, he will be your teacher. When you learn that on a regular basis, it's beautiful. Say, so, okay, I can, he can teach me. And then I get some, again, Bible teaching from someone else, and I, I get some preaching, or I get something, and that's an ad, and they're ads, and the fruit starts taking more of you. And the indwelling fruit of meekness and temperance against such there is no law, your faith gets stronger, and you're going, wow, fruit is manifested in my life. It's one of my favorite little illustrations. You telling me that you're, I'm just so thankful that God has made me a humble person. I really am probably the most humble person that I know. That's like a believer saying, I thank God that I'm not like that publican. I thank God that I have love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness. In fact, I think other believers should be around me more. Because, you know, I manifest the fruit of the Spirit everywhere I go, Steve. You know that? I do, Bill. I mean, I'm just the nicest be believer in Jesus I know. I'm the most Spirit-filled person I know. Sorry, that's not manifesting the fruit. It's when someone comes up to you and says, you have gentleness in the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your long suffering. In fact, most of you husbands should turn to your wife and tell her that this afternoon. Only three laughed. Obviously, the husband's the one who's long suffering. There you go. It's interesting that the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit, we're trying to find a way to have us tell ourselves that we're doing it really well when, uh-uh, uh-uh. I put up John chapter number 15, a couple of verses, verse number 4. Abide in me and I in you, and the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. We understand the fruit-bearing type of fruit this is. That if you abide in me, there will be people that will come to Jesus Christ. As much as you have the bearing of fruit of the Holy Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is another kind of fruit that works in the body of Christ. That fruit back and forth proves out what Jesus Christ said. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have a love one for another. Since the fruit of the Spirit starts with love, it would be good if the love showed up from Jesus Christ. Verse number 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in you. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Verse number 8, one of my faves, herein is my Father glorified. This was a theme verse for our conference a number of years ago. That you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Hey, church, brothers and sisters in the Lord, this is for you as Paul is teaching us, saying, hey, we have the ability to manifest the fruit of the Spirit and then bear fruit, which is to see people that are lost come to Jesus Christ. Spoiler alert, life is a battle. Life is truly a battle, and it is real. And as we looked at last week, and we, uh, two weeks ago, we outlined 13 through 18, and we saw that, hey, you can choose the license or the legalism or the liberty. This is just the second part of that. So let me just cover a little bit of stuff here, and then again at the end make a little bit practical application for you. When I think of what verses 19 through 26 are teaching us, we see the, the flesh and its concept, the characteristics of the flesh, the conflict that the flesh brings. Look, at, look in your Bible, verse number 19. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. What does it mean to 
be in a place where lasciviousness is a sin of your flesh and your life believer. It's lewdness. It's promoting or partaking in anything that fosters sexual sin, idolatry, image worship of anything besides God in the heart, witchcraft, sorcery, practice of dealing with evil spirits, hatred, having a bitter dislike, an abhorrence, malice. These are all sins that can come from the flesh. There's flesh sins and demonism sins. There's prideful and religious sins. There's the depravity of man's sins at the end of verse number, I mean the beginning of verse number 21. You see witchcraft. No, I wouldn't do any of that. Fornication never would go near that stuff. Adultery, uncleanness, none of that stuff. But look at what it's saying there in verse 20. Variance. Maybe some of you know what that means. It means dissensions, discord, debates. Can a believer do that? It says there emulations, jealousy, striving to excel at the expense of another person. In your flesh there dwelleth no good thing, wrath, to have indignation and fierceness, rage, determined and lasting anger. These six things that the Lord, hey, yea, seven are abomination to him. You see, when people see the scriptures in this list, they go, wow, look at all these awful sins there are. When we compare this with 1 Corinthians 6 in a little bit, there's similarities, yes, but there's a major difference. The similarities in the list, they both excluded inheritance in the kingdom of God, but the audience is different. Again, verse number 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. We'll look at 1 Corinthians again here in a little bit. But in 1 Corinthians 6, he's making sure when he gives this incredible list, he's saying, hey, the unrighteous, they were called adulterers. He said, and such were some of you, which you're believers, but some of you when you were lost, you were like that. You see, those are believers who used to be the ERSs. Here you go in this list of sins. You see the word S, you see it singularly. You see the word S, you see the word singular. You see each one of them. Revelings, emulations, heresies. This is a list of sins. When a lost person commits adultery, they're an adulterer. They're lost. When someone who's born again commits adultery, they're a child of God, a son of God, who committed adultery. When a lost person who's going to go to hell because, see, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God when it comes to salvation, hey, they're never going to be in the Lamb's book of life. They are an adulter, idolater. They're a fornicator. They're not born again. They're lost. But when you and I as believers put something on our heart that is above God in our flesh, it's idolatry. When we emulate or cause jealousy and strife in the body, when we have strife with someone else, when there's seditions or factions, disorder, stirring up strife. Throughout your New Testament, it talks about those things in the, in the, in the church. Those are believers who are carrying out those sins in the flesh because they're not being led by the Spirit of God. And they and we, yes, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Guess what? You can't undo salvation. Those sins and those things, you know what they do to you? They cause us to lose rewards and inheritance at the judgment seat of Christ. Quick spoil alert. There's a man named Samson. Anybody know about that guy in the Old Testament? Do you know where he's found in the New Testament? In the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter number 11 which is like an Old Testament saved person. Their faith is counted for righteousness. Did he live a life that was reflective of the Spirit of the Lord being on him 
If you see his study in Judges, you'll find out, I believe it's mentioned four times, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon his life. And yet, he lived a life like that. You see, we have to understand the teaching of the Word of God and the clarity of what Paul's teaching the brethren. Galatians 5.21 mentions that they which do such things. Look at it right there. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That is a Christian, brother in verse 13, who allows his flesh to manifest itself. This is not a list of sinners, but a list of sins. And if you think that you're beyond any of these, walk away from God for a little while, believer. And the conviction comes, and the conviction comes, and the conviction comes, and the conviction comes, and and you keep on backpedaling. You call to the Lord to make things right, you make things right, and you keep on backpedaling, and then an instant comes up before you, and there's a temptation, and you end up in a place where there's seditions and idolatry, there's revelings, there's things that go on in your life, and you go, how did I get to the place where I ended up causing discord? Your flesh had its way for a while. See, in the legal and doctrinal sense, a Christian cannot be an adulterer. If he commits adultery, he's a Christian who's committed adultery. A lost person is a sinner, while a saved person is a child of God who sins. That's the Bible. How many Bible verses do you need? Come to my office afterwards, I'll sit down with you and show you every Bible verse I can find, which is a ton. Because we're born again. Our inheritance that we don't inherit is going to suffer loss. We will not reign with Christ like we could have, but we'll still be saved. Can't take my name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Can't mess with that. I'm a son of God. But as a son of God, sometimes I act like a fool, but I'm not a foolish person according to the Word of God, but I act according to my flesh. So I'll be the only one that is the example. Although the sin is the same, the loss of the inheritance is the same, the perspective is different because of the decision to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. The lost are disowned, while the saved who sin have an amount of their inheritance that's erased and reduced. You have no idea what God's got meant for you and I in our inheritance. If we would just let the Spirit of God follow, I mean lead us and we would follow him. That's what, they, that's what uh, Paul's teaching us. Think of, again, the prodigal son and what he did. You see, he had a faith walk battle, just like you and me. He had a faith walk battle. The work of the flesh, sure, I'd love that. That's what he wanted. Give me my money. And the older son kept his inheritance. All he wanted was to come back. He did the works of his flesh and he finally was at the end of himself and he came back. Why? Because it tells us that that man never lost his sonship with the father. And as I repeat that and remind you what it's saying, you and I need to just lock down and say, you know what? Our God is an awesome God. Our Father is a merciful Father. He is so gracious. He is slow to anger. He is rich in mercy. And he will not kick me out the side door, but he wants more for me. He wants more for you. He wants you to live in Jesus by the word of God, by the spirit of God. Be led by the spirit of God. He doesn't want what you want. He wants what he wants. And what he wants is in his word. I need more of him. I need less of me. I'm tired of me. You see, the lost sinner, they're unrighteous and they're filthy. But the saved believer who do such things, which do such things, they're living in a place where flesh has had the opportunity to have its way. That can be a miserable time with the Lord. Let me show you three simple things in the next few minutes before we have the Lord's Supper that will tie this together. Here you go. The works of the flesh, we've talked about it. So the battle, remember the battle, the battle of life, it's real. The battle includes loss of inheritance but not sonship. I've mentioned it a few times. The Bible teaches us clearly. As it says in Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 21, you see it right in front of you. That they which do such things shall not inherit. Listen, we lose these incredible rewards that he has for us. 
Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Go there with me real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. And let's see what the Bible says. You say, that list over there in 1 Corinthians 6, it's, it's power. Oh gosh, it's, it's a rough list. I like got three or four or five messages out of that area from others that pe preach through this thing. Pick it up in verse number 9, 1 Corinthians 6. It says what? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Who is he speaking to? Remember the word of God. You can't just say everything with just because it has a term. Who is he speaking to? The unrighteous. He's speaking to the church at Corinth, but he's saying, hey, I'm speaking about those that are unrighteous. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived, be not deceived, neither fornicate oars, nor adulterers, nor, uh, excuse me, nor, excuse me, neither fornicators, nor uh, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, as it says up there. And such were some, were some of you. But what does it say about those that are no longer them, but that was your identity? But now your identity is in Christ. It says, you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There's no conflict in Scripture at all. Absolutely none. It's clear the audience, he's telling the church as he's writing the letter, look, the works of the flesh manifest are these. When they manifest themselves, they're not good. Believer, you're going to lose something out. You're going to lose out on your rewards. You're going to lose, lose out on some stuff in your inheritance. You're, you're, but hey, lost person, some, such as some as you were you, you unrighteous, you'll never get nothing. In fact, you'll never get salvation because you never called on the name of the Lord to save you. The passage in Galatians teaches very clearly that the believer can lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ if he abuses his liberty and allows his flesh to control and take over him. There's no loss of salvation, only inheritance. The second thing I want you to see here in the practical application is the fruit of the Spirit. So we looked at the flesh first, now we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. For me today, for you today, the battle returns Eternal rewards, not temporal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope everybody sees how I'm walking around with the fruit of the Spirit. I wish I'd get some accolades for that. You go back to Galatians chapter number 5, and you see those fruit of the Spirit. Verse number 22 says, Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I'm going to talk about those next week as we get into chapter number six and reference that fruit because it's huge and it's very, very important. There's the upward fruit. There's the outward fruit. There's the inward fruit. There's the fruit of that spirit where it goes manward that I'm able to have long suffering and gentleness and goodness with people. Why is it that people don't understand that I'm a wonderful person, that I'm good to them? I see that I have in my own life love, joy, and peace. Why am I not getting any rewards for that? Why isn't the church rewarding me for that stuff? Your rewards are not for here. They're eternal rewards. The fruit of the Spirit life means that you're not going to see that. And that's part of the battle. Because sometimes we want to know that we're doing good by other people's recognition. Go to Colossians chapter number 3. It says up on the screen, Colossians 3, verses number 23 through 25. It says there, and whatsoever you do, you're familiar, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Now, let's keep in mind the verbiage here. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. We serve the Lord Christ. We, we believers, knowing that the Lord, of the, of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Verse 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Suffer loss. And your rewards are gain. Verses 23 through 25. Colossians chapter number 3. You see in there that you receive the reward of the inheritance. It says in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. That's up on the screen as well. 
I should have included verse number 11, 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying, verse 11, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet be abi he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He can't. Born again. But guess what? In him, when we suffer for him and suffer for his name's sake, we reign. That reward sounds beautiful. If we say, ah, how many times have we rejected the opportunity? It doesn't mean that you're lost. It means that you would worship or have idolatry in your own heart as a believer because you become more important. But if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. That's eternal reward that's coming. That's an eternal inheritance that's coming. So lastly, you get this. Here it is. The last thought. Another practical way where we say we're going to walk in the spirit. We're going to walk in the spirit. Go to Philippians chapter number 2. As I speak of this last thing. You walk in the spirit, the battle requires decisions. Decisions to live faith, not vainglory. It's said in Galatians that, hey, this vainglory thing, I mentioned it when I was, I was reading the end of chapter number five, that, hey, we have a tendency to do things for the wrong reason. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Oh, I'm going to, uh, hey, I'm going to live in the spirit, but then I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to live it for vainglory, then that's contradictory to the Holy Spirit of God. Philippians chapter number 2 tells us exactly our approach. I'll pick it up in verse number 1. Many of you are familiar with this ver these verses. If there be, excuse me, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Why would I go about doing anything in that area because I love to please my flesh or think that my flesh can do something to appease or make happy holy God through watching people watch my outward appearance. That's vain glory. That's for nothing. Strife. Ah, see, I did it. I had to do it, so I just did it. He says, do it in lowliness of mind and let each esteem other better than themselves and let not every man Look on his own things, but every man also in the things of others. Galatians chapter number 2. We go back there and finish our message there. We know what's in Galatians chapter number 2. Verses 19 through 21, our theme verse. I should have put 19 up there. I know you all forgive me for that. It says, for though, for I, excuse me, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Back up to verse number 19. That I might live unto God. Whew. I'm dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. I do not frustrate the grace of God. You see, believers, as we come to the end and look at the Lord's Supper, I want you to be reminded of the victory you have in Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate our victory in Jesus. We remember what he did for us. I sometimes think that we don't really grasp the depth of the Passover representation here. We don't quite comprehend in the Lord's Supper what we are doing, but we're remembering what Christ did for us. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
My life is to walk with God. Walk in the Spirit. That's the way we celebrate the Lord's Supper today. Our Father in heaven, as we come to you in this time in our worship and complete service, Father, I just want to thank you once again for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't thank you enough, Father, for what you've done for me and for all of us as believers. Thank you for the perfect and holy Word of God. And thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit within us. Thank you for the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the beautiful picture that we have together as we celebrate our victory in Jesus together at the Lord's Supper. I pray that we will walk away from our time together, gather together in worship, in song, in prayer, in the Word of God, and say, you know what? God, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, I'm going to walk this week by you in your spirit. God, give us a great time in celebrating your supper, the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen.